good to see everybody. Uh, there are some we need to remember in our prayers. First off, uh, in case you don't know, Ruth Moore passed away this morning, or I mean yesterday morning, at 11 o'clock, Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. Her daughter-in-law said that she passed peacefully and uh, she couldn't tell she had any pain and she crossed over to Jordan Saturday morning at 11 o'clock she will be missed won't she what a wonderful woman she was wonderful wonderful Christian lady that we will all miss. The services, uh, by the way, are, are pending. A friend of Beverly Abercrombie, Lamont Peterson, is in need of prayers. He has a heart problem, and he's in the Navarro Hospital. Yes, Beverly. Oh, her. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. She is in need of our prayers. She has a heart problem, and she is in Navarro Hospital. Pardon me on that. And we need to continue to remember Jerry Cockerman. He... Had, it was in the hospital, uh, I think it was Friday, had a blood transfusion. He may be out of the hospital now. Anybody know? Uh, Christine? He's at home? It, okay, back with his wife. Okay, thank you, Christine. Uh, Caleb Ivy's mother, Brenda Bearden is not well she's undergoing i'm sorry oh boy uh, when did that happen okay monday boy forgive me i uh, megan gould she began her chemo treatment on Friday and uh, we need to remember her Don Corley's brother Bob he lives in Sherman uh, he's having circulation problems and we need to remember him and then Wanda Horner and Bella Webster and uh, Shirley Wardlaw and Bobby Roberts and Lana Powers Juanita McCary Yvonne Ainsworth, Marcia Lou broke her arm, and Alton Albert. Uh, we also, anybody else? I'm, oh, Sandra had knee surgery, didn't she? Okay, she, thank you, Nancy. So we have uh, quite a number. Uh, one time when I was uh, when I was a young fella, <laughs> um, should I even should I just go on? When I was a young fella, I was uh, you know, with our group that was going to uh, serve the communion and say the prayers and the announcements. We all met one in the in a room, and so it was my turn. I was. I don't know, 22, and it's my turn to uh, do the announcements, and there was no announcements to do. They, nobody knew where they were, and so finally this man, or guy my age, grabbed this up, handed it to me, said, this is good. So I did that, got up there, being a young fella, and most of those people, it was the bulletin was two weeks old. And I did not do well. And 
I did not do well just a moment ago. So forgive me. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this day and the blessing and the privilege we have to be here to study your word and to worship you. Heavenly Father, we pray for the Ruth Moore family. Ask that you be with that family and comfort them and help us to support them in every way possible. We're thankful for the life of Ruth and we appreciate so much having known her and we're thankful for her life. We pray for Jerry Cockerman and all those that were mentioned, Megan Gould. We pray for Don Corley's brother. We pray for those that are recovering from stroke and ask that you be with them if it's possible their good health will return. We pray for those that have lost loved ones. Heavenly Father, we pray for Dan and for Christine. We ask that you strengthen them and comfort them and help us to support them and love them. We pray for Beverly Cook's family, her loss of her uncle. We ask that you be with that family. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for our physical blessings that you give us every day. But dear Lord, we're thankful most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us, shed his blood on the cross for our sins. And Lord, help us this morning as we study that the things that we learn, your will for our lives, we'll be able to apply them every day and grow in knowledge and grace. Lord, we ask that you forgive us when we fail you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, I left off uh, at uh, verse number 7, but I'm going to back up. And you remember last Sunday, uh, we discussed the Lord's Supper. We talked everything and discussed everything that I could think of and you could think of about the Lord's Supper. And it was important that we do that because we had to be reminded from time to time. And we also are be able to see a little bit more of what Paul did at Troas when we get there to the Lord's Supper. And so in Acts chapter 20, verse 1 through 3, we know from also from chapter 19, verse 22, Paul sent Timothy and Erastus to Macedonia, but Paul stayed at Ephesus until after Pentecost. And that's in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 8 and 9, we, we talked about. In verse 1, after the uproar was ceased, uh, he exhorted the Christians there. He left the Macedonian, he left to go to the Macedonian districts, verse 2. He went to Greece in verse 3, and he stayed there three months. And while he was there, a plot was formed by the Jews. And he considered going back to Syria, but instead he goes back through Macedonia. He's probably visiting Philippi and Berea and Thessalonica and all these other cities because that's what God wants him to do. In Macedonia, in verse 4, he was accompanied by all those men that are shown in verse 4. And they, and then they went on ahead to Troas, verse 5, while Paul stayed behind with Luke, and then they came after five days, verse 6. And then he stayed in Troas for seven days. 
And you think, wonder why, besides some other work that he was doing. He wanted to be there for the Lord's Supper. So he stays there seven days. Troas is this, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a tip of Asia. It's the ancient city of Troy. We know it in history books as Troy. It was a gateway from Asia to Europe. And so he is there in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12. We're told that God or a door was opened for Paul, which God provided that opening. And so in verse 7, let's pick it up in verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day. And he prolonged his message until midnight. Notice in verse 7, they gathered together to break bread. It wasn't a common meal. It was different from a common meal. It's the Lord's Supper. And then they had a common meal afterwards. Paul ate after uh, so in verse 8, there were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered together, and there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. Verse 10, but... uh, But Paul went down and fell upon him, and after embracing him, he said, Do not be troubled, for his life is in him. In verse 11, when he had gone back up and broken the bread. Oh, wait a minute. Did did I read 10? Paul went down and fell upon him, and after embracing him, he said, Do not be troubled, for his life is in him. Now, verse 11. When he had gone back up and had broken bread and eaten and talked with them a long time, a while until daybreak, and then he left. And they took uh, away the boy alive and were greatly comforted. Break time. Okay, now verse 7. On the first day of the week, they're meeting together, and they're partaking of the Lord's Supper. It's not a common meal, just like we talked about last Sunday. It's not a common meal. Paul preached to them, and he's planning to leave the next day, but he went ahead and preached till midnight. wonder how come. (laughs) He got carried away. (laughs) Yeah. I'm sorry, Nancy. Had a lot to say. Yeah, he did. He had a lot to say. And so on the first day of the week, it became the day of Christianity. How do I know that? How do we know that? Because in Revelations 1 and verse 10, what is that day? It's the Lord's day. And, and that's how you, one of the proofs of the divinity of Jesus Christ, that everything is the truth because the, the major day was what day before Jesus came to this earth? The Sabbath. And the Sabbath was nailed to the cross along with the old law, and everything after that began the first day of the week. So they met together on the first day of the week to partake of the Lord's Supper. Jesus rose from the dead the first day of the week. He appeared to his apostles the first day of the week. The Corinthians were told to take up a collection every first day of the week. Um, But take the Lord's Supper. We just saw first day of the week. Uh, It's called the Lord's Day. And, And so we get the point, don't we? That is the day. That is the day. It's the Lord's Day. All day. So here they are in verse 8. They're gathered together. Now, I want you to notice something because I 
I'm telling you, I get confused on what we're going to be looking at, and it really doesn't matter. I'm trying to figure out where Paul is, how big the building is, if it has three floors, if it has two floors and windows, and, and the young man was sitting in the third floor, this says, and he fell, and he fell all the way to the floor because Paul went down to him and then went back up. So it, what kind of building doesn't matter. What happened does. So... They were gathered together, verse 8. A lot of lamps in the upper room. You can see that. You can imagine yourself there when Paul is preaching. There are all kinds of lamps in this upper room. And imagine all that smoke from them lamps. And it's getting late. I don't know what the temperature was, but it was too much for this young man he it must have been a large building a large place because it says he fell my my version says he fell from the third floor and paul was preaching to them i don't know if he was on the third floor or the middle floor second floor but he went to the upper room to do all this and so paul's doing some preaching he got carried away he's preaching to midnight paul is preaching and this young man what happens to him sitting in the windowsill? He fell all the way to the bottom. <laughs> How's his health? He's dead. Luke, the physician who wrote this, he, he knows he's dead. He's convinced he's dead. And so Paul, in verse 10, went down embraced him and brought him back and Paul said do not be troubled for his life is in him he was dead and now he's not Paul with the power of God brings him back from the dead in verse 11 then Paul went back up it says had this meal that he ate he needs some in uh, strength because he knows he's going to go on the trip and so he eats he talks to them until daybreak and then he did what he left verse 13 but we if you notice we Luke says he's without Paul they set sail from Troas all those followers and, and, and helpers and assistants, they set sail from Troas to this Asos by the sea by, uh, and by boat where he's going it's about 40 miles. By land it's only halfway. So Paul is going to go the halfway part. Paul stays there in Troas and then he walks by land. So next morning he rejoined them in verse 14 and where they... Uh, there they took him on board. We're getting to the part that I want to work hard on. <laughs> he gets on board. The next day they passed through all those places on the way to Miletus, verse 15. Those towns that are mentioned here are not on the map. They're probably along the seacoast. He's on his way to Miletus, which is on the map. Paul's in a hurry. He sails past Ephesus. How long was he in Ephesus? Do you remember? Anybody remember? Remember? He, he's there at least three years. So he sails on past Ephesus in verse 16. He wants to be in Jerusalem. That's where he's supposed to go, to Jerusalem. He want, Paul wants to be there on the day of Pentecost, but he, he doesn't want to go on until he has a chance to visit with who? The elders at Ephesus, he doesn't, he's in a hurry. He's in a hurry to go to Jerusalem, but he isn't in that big a hurry that he won't stop on the seacoast, which was a short distance away from Ephesus, and call for who? Who's he calling for? The elders. Hey, he has this special relationship with them. Do we have a special relationship with our elders? You bet you. <laughs> you bet. Now, before I go on, 
I want to talk a little bit about the elders. I will discuss that office. You can find the qualification of elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 7, and also Titus chapter 1, 5 through 11. Both of those locations give the qualifications of elders. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, he says, if you aspire to be an elder, it's what? Do you remember? It's a fine work, he says. It's a fine work you desire. Who's... If you're going to be an elder, you have to what? Right there. If you're going to be an elder, what's the, the first step? <laughs> I guess you could say. Huh? You have to want to. You have to aspire to. And so whether he, a, a man has to aspire to that. And if he does aspire to it, he, it is, Paul says, a fine work he desires to do. An elder, if you, I'm just going to briefly mention some of the qualifications. He, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, or chapter 3, an elder's above reproach. He's the husband of one wife. He's temperate. He's prudent. He's respectable, he's hospitable, he's able to teach, but he's not addicted to wine, he's not quarrelsome, he's gentle, he's peaceable, he's free of the love of money, he manages his own household well, keeping his children under control. He's not a new convert, he's of good reputation. Uh, with those outside the church. Now, if you looked at Titus chapter 1, beginning at verse 5, the same qualifications, but he expands a little bit. He mentions some things here. He expands on the words, uh, such as uh, having children who believe that he, an elder is not self-willed. He's not quick-tempered. He loves what is good. He's self-controlled. He's sensible. He's just. He's devout. And he holds fast the faithful word. He's able to exhort and refute by sound doctrine. Now, this is the qualifications. Now, so what are the duties of an elder. What are, what, what are his duties? Well, we're going to look at some real quick. And I want to, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to, us to look at that when Paul wants to meet those elders and he, he knows he'll never see them again. And you know what these men are that Paul is visiting with. And so, what are their duties? Some of them. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, we're going to look at here in just a few minutes. They are to be on guard. Who are they to be on guard for? Acts 20, verse 28. I, I'm sorry? For us, the flock. But he says also for yourself. For yourself. And, and I... I Hold on to that thought because we're going to look at that or talk about that in just a minute. They are to oversee and shepherd the church. Acts 20, verse 28. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. They are to shepherd the flock. Uh, they are to exercise oversight, not for gain, sordid gain, but willingly, voluntarily. They're not under compulsion to be an elder. They volunteered for it. <laughs> and they're not... Oh, yes, sir.
chapter. Um, assuming qualifications and all of that, and we'd all say that we want to do what God wants us to do. Mm -hmm. and that we would all, I think, admit to that. Yeah. And certainly, uh, being willing to serve as an elder is uh, it is necessary. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. So, so not only do we need to be willing, obviously we, we yeah. need to be, but mm -hmm. if we have qualifications and 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 we would might be willing, God wants us yes. as a, as that kind of Christian or that that at that spot in our life. Yes, sir. He wants us to serve. Yes. And I think sometimes that's a that's a challenge for some of us to mm -hmm. to understand that it's not just that we need to be willing. But God wants us yeah. to be willing. Thank you, Don. Thank you very much. Anything else? You sure? Thank you. There are also, where we were reading there, they're not the Lord over us in the best way. He gives the best way not to, for that not to happen by being an example in their own life for us. They're an example to us by being humble and, and being an example. They won't have to worry about that. Yes? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Helen. Um, uh, Hebrews 13 and verse 17. Uh, they are our leaders. Hebrews 13 and verse 17. They are to rule well. Um, one of their duties. They are to, like Helen said, keep watch over our souls because why? They are going to have to what? Answer for it. They got to give an account. Now, I mean, I can tell you that that has to be, and I know it is for our elders, that has to be the thing they think about constantly. Can you imagine that responsibility? That you have to rule well, you have to guide the flock, you have to be an example, you have to shepherd their, you have to watch for their souls. They got to give account for that. Now, I'm going to mention something. I don't know when to want to mention it. I'll mention it. I mention it now. <laughs> In that same verse is also our attitude that we're to have for our elders, that we're to have, every one of us. In verse 17 of Hebrew 13, we're to obey them. We are to submit to them. We are to recognize in our hearts and our minds that they are watching over our souls and we have to remember that they got to give an account but I want you to notice something else and this should wake us all up we should live our lives so that our elders do not have any grief over us 
in Hebrews 13 and verse 17, he says, or it will be for us unprofitable. Now, I don't know exactly what that word means, but I do not want it to be unprofitable for me, do you? None of us. They have a burden, and we're to make sure that at least we do our part and we don't cause them grief or it will be unprofitable for you. First uh, Timothy 5 verse 17 tells the elders' qualifications too. First uh, Timothy 5 17, their, their duties. They are to rule well. They are to work hard. Uh, especially teaching and preaching, uh, they are responsible for that. They, uh, in fact, if they teach and preach, they're eligible. It'd be a double honor for them. As they, yes. I think each one of us. I, think I was waiting for you to say that. <laughs> I know exactly. Huh? Yeah, you've seen that, haven't you? I have too. Yeah, and it's not all about them knowing us. Yeah. We're part of the flock. Yeah. We love each other. Yeah. And we need to talk to one another. We need yeah. to, to be close to one another. Yeah. And through that, I think the elders, they can work better. Yeah. Because we're part of the flock. Amen. Part. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for saying that. I'll also mention while you're there. Are these qualifications just for them? No. We, every one of us in here, should have these qualifications. This is a Christian. This is a Christian. This is the way we are to be. Yes. like I carry that same responsibility on me for my own family that I'm the head of the family you know I'm a shepherd of the flock or what you call it my yes. family yes, so sir. I carry that same load on my family yes sir thank you James <clears throat> anybody else okay I what I've done is briefly covered the qualifications the experience of elders what their duties are and what we are obligated to do. Now I want to go to verse 17. He, he has the elders come to him. Verse 17. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called to him or the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that, both, or saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life or any account as dear to myself that I may finish my course 
and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Now, let's just stop there and let's, let's look this part over, and then we'll go on. So in verse 17, he sends for him. Uh, he didn't have time to go to Ephesus. I, he's in a hurry. I don't know why he didn't go to Ephesus. But he's sure when he got to that seaport town, just a little ways from there, the first thing he did was send for these elders. He was not going to leave until when? Until he did this. Um, I'm glad he did. We are thankful he did because we're going to have this and a few verses after this recorded for us some of the most moving and rewarding conversations that we can be part of between Paul and these elders. Verse 17, they went from Miletus or from Miletus on the coast. He sent to Ephesus, called for the elders. Paul is trying to get to Jerusalem, but one thing he feels he must do first is get the elders of the church there. Some of the most beautiful words of love. He knew, didn't he, he was in trouble. Didn't Paul know he was in trouble? You bet he knew he was in trouble. When we're in trouble, what's good for us? Who do we like to see as the flock? Who do we want to see? I tell you, if I get so sick that I don't think I'm going to make it till tomorrow, boy, I want an elder there. I, I, there's nothing magical. It's just he's an overseer and a shepherd, and he cares for my soul, and I want him there praying for me. <laughs> do you? He wasn't leaving until he got to see those elders. Yeah. Yeah. That's really important, isn't it, Daryl? Yeah. Yeah, because we've seen it turn south, haven't we? We've seen somebody get mad. Well, the elders didn't come and see me. They, don't, they act like they don't care. And we get mad, we swell up, and we what? We leave the church when they never knew to start with. Uh, he knew he was in trouble. He knew that he would never see them again, ever. It, and he loves them. They're special to him. And so, verse 18, when they come, he reminded them that he was with them since the first time they set foot in, that Paul set foot in Asia and how much they endured together, trials and struggles. And Paul says in verse 19, I served the Lord with what? Humility and tears. And so he had them... And with them, he was, he had with them endured all of these plots by the Jews. I'll get my words straight in a second. <laughs> Even at this, he says in verse 20, he never shrunk from teaching and preaching. He would go even from house to house. Verse 21, he'd preach both Jews and the Greeks. These elders are involved with him in this. And repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 22 tells, he says he tells them he was bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. He's telling them what's fixing to happen to me. The Holy Spirit revealed to Paul, verse 23, that bonds and afflictions wait him. Paul says he's not worried about his life. What will happen to me? Verse 23, the Holy Spirit revealed it to Paul, the bonds and afflictions away. In verse 24, he's not worried about his life. He's not worried about what they will do to him. He wants to finish the course. 
He wants to finish the ministry that God gave him to preach the gospel of the grace of the Lord, grace of God. Verse 25. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Now watch this in verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own, what? Selves. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on alert. Remembering that night, that night and day. For a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. Boy, I wish I could finish this. I'm going to stop because, for a second because I got to stop. Be on guard for yourselves and for the flock. And that those will come in where? Even among who? Huh? Us. Even among who else? Huh? The elders. That's why we have to be on guard. Paul, tell me what happened well, to that church. Fast forward a little bit. Church history says by 125, when John died in 95, and by 125, so we're talking 20 years, that church in Ephesus had developed a monarchical bishop idea. And everybody hear that? So within about 60 years, 60 years, this, this came true. Within 60 years, within 60 years, this church was troubled. Well, in, in Revela John wrote Revelation in 95, in 30 years. In 30 years, it was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they left their first love within 30 years. So you see, he's talking to them on, right there on, on the seacoast. And he knows what's going to happen. And he knows their responsibilities and, and how heavy on their heart they're going to be. And what a trial it's going to be, even for them as Christians. Now, next week we're going to finish this. And I'll, so I want you to mark your place there, and we're going to go on. We're going to finish this conversation. Also pointing right at us, yes. Thank you, Helen. Verse 28, he tells them the remedy, how to, how to make sure that doesn't happen. There you go. Dedicate yourself to the God's Word. Yeah. Stay in that. Stay in God's Word. Evidently, they did not stay in the Word of God. Aren't we lucky? Again, in our day's time, though, how many faithful preachers we've had in the past that have fallen off yeah. doing other ways and doing other things because they didn't adhere to it. Yeah. To. Yeah. There are even preachers that, that dig their heels in against the elders. I don't know why, other than disobedience. We're sure lucky that we have good men, and I know their concerns. It's all about them and not about the Lord. That's right. They're, you're right. Our men are concerned about souls, all of us. 
that we know the truth, that we guard against all these things we're going to be talking about next week. It's heavy on their hearts. Anybody have anything else? We must pray for our elders. We sure should. Yeah. They're just like us. Anybody else? You've been a very good class. We don't need us to